Hey everyone, welcome back to another lesson. This lesson is on peptic ulcer disease. So we're going to talk about what it is, what causes peptic ulcer disease. We're also going to talk about some of the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So what is peptic ulcer disease? Peptic ulcer disease is a disease of focal defects or discontinuation, which really means ulceration of the gastrointestinal mucosa, which is the lining of the esophagus, the stomach, and the duodenum or the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. We're not going to talk about esophageal ulcers in this lesson, but we're going to talk about ulcers that affect the stomach and the duodenum, or the first part of the small intestine. So when an ulcer affects the stomach, that is a gastric ulcer, and when an ulcer affects the duodenum, that is a duodenal ulcer. What is the epidemiology of peptic ulcer disease? So it is a worldwide phenomenon, so it occurs in all countries around the world, and it occurs in a significant portion of the population, roughly speaking, around 5 to 10 percent have a lifetime risk of developing peptic ulcer disease. Duodenal ulcers are four times more likely to occur than gastric ulcers, and duodenal ulcers are more likely to occur in males. So those are two key important notes to make here. Now let's talk about some of the causes or etiologies of peptic ulcer disease. So some of the common etiologies include helicobacter pylori infection, which is by far the most common cause of peptic ulcer disease. Medications are another important category of causes of peptic ulcer disease. And by far, the number one medication here is going to be NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So you can think of things like ibuprofen or Advil. Other medications include corticosteroids, bisphosphonates, and 5-fluorouracil, which is a chemotherapy drug. So all of these medications can lead to peptic ulcer disease. Some other etiologies include viral infections, one of them being cytomegalovirus. Physiological stress can also lead to peptic ulcer disease, especially if it's chronic stress. Crohn's disease can also lead to peptic ulcer disease due to chronic inflammation of those certain areas in the gastrointestinal system. Vascular insufficiency can also be a cause of peptic ulcer disease. Hypersecretory states can also lead to peptic ulcer disease, and one of them is Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Another one can be gastronoma, and we can also see it with hyperparathyroidism and systemic mastocytosis. Malignancies can also lead to peptic ulcer disease, and these normally cause a necrotic ulcer. And then there's also idiopathic causes of peptic ulcer disease. Special cases of peptic ulcer disease include Curling's ulcer. So Curling's ulcer is a type of ulceration that occurs in severe burn patients. And there's also another specific type of ulcer, which is a Cushing's ulcer. This is related to elevated intracranial pressure. And there's some influencing factors as to what makes some peptic ulcers worse. So they're not necessarily the cause of the ulcer itself, but they are something that may make the ulcer or symptoms related to the ulcer worse. These include alcohol, which may irritate or worsen the damage to the gastric mucosa, and smoking, which the data is not clear here, but it seems to increase the risk of ulcers, complications, mortality, and impairs healing of ulcers. So it might not be necessarily a cause of an ulceration, but it seems to play a role in making the ulcer worse and impairing the healing of the ulcer. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology behind the formation of an ulcer. An ulcer really forms because destructive processes outweigh protective mechanisms in the gastrointestinal mucosa, whether that be in the stomach or the esophagus or the duodenum. So the exact mechanism as to why this occurs depends on the cause. Now we're going to talk about the most common causes here. And by far, again, the most common cause is helicobacter pylori infections. And the reason why a helicobacter pylori infection causes gastric ulcers is because bacteria burrow into stomach lining, causing inflammation. And this prolonged inflammation can lead to ulceration. So this prolonged inflammation, you can think of it as a balance. So the prolonged inflammation is increased destructive processes and the protective mechanisms cannot compensate. So we're going to have more destructive processes than protective mechanisms. That's why we're going to see ulcerations occur. We also talked about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs being an important cause of ulcers. The reason being is that NSAIDs, like ibuprofen, inhibit an enzyme known as COX-1 or cyclooxygenase-1, which reduces prostaglandin synthesis. 
And the reason this is important is that prostaglandins have a protective effect in the gastrointestinal mucosa. So if you are reducing the production of prostaglandins by taking NSAIDs like ibuprofen for prolonged periods of time, you're going to reduce your protective mechanism. So the destructive process is going to outcompete that protective mechanism. And some other important causes to note include the hypersecretory states like zollinger ellison syndrome. These hypersecretory states lead to increased gastric acidity, which overwhelms protective processes. Viral infections like cytomegalovirus, which have similar mechanisms as to H. pylori, so they lead to inflammation within the gastrointestinal lining. So this overwhelms those protective mechanisms, leading to ulceration. And then some other stressors, including vascular insufficiency, burns, and head injuries. So we talked about some of those physiologic stressors being causes of ulceration. The reason being is that in some cases, like vascular insufficiency, it's ischemia. So if there's not enough blood getting to the stomach to nourish the gastrointestinal lining, we're going to lose that protective mechanism, that healing mechanism. So it's going to lead to ulcerations. And some head injuries can lead to overactivation of the vagus nerve, which increases gastric acidity. And this can lead to increased destructive processes, again, overcoming those protective mechanisms and leading to an ulcer formation. Now let's talk about the clinical presentation of peptic ulcer disease. It's important to note that 20% of patients with peptic ulcer disease are asymptomatic, which means they don't have any symptoms. An important symptom to note with peptic ulcer disease is dyspepsia. This is actually the most common symptom, and it is an epigastric sensation. So epigastric is the area in the center of your abdomen above your belly button. And the sensation is described as a pain or discomfort, and it can also be noted as gnawing, burning, or bloating. Patients with peptic ulcer disease can also describe a sensation of fullness, and early satiety, so early satiety is where they become full very quickly and easily. So they may feel that they have a large appetite. They can eat a lot, but once they start eating, they get full very quickly. That is early satiety. Nausea and vomiting can also be a symptom of peptic ulcer disease, although this is more uncommon. Epigastric pain, again, related to the dyspepsia. Bleeding can also occur, and this can lead to hematemesis, which is vomiting up of blood, and can also lead to Melina, so a dark black tarry stool, and hematochesia can also occur, which is a red bloody stool. And there can also be changes in weight. So weight loss can occur, weight gain can occur, depending on the type of ulcer. And symptom onset and severity differs between gastric and duodenal ulcers. We're going to talk about the differences in the next slide. If you want more information on symptoms and why symptoms occur more specifically, please check out my lesson on signs and symptoms of peptic ulcer disease. Now let's talk about the differences between duodenal and gastric ulcers and why and when symptoms occur with each of them. So with gastric ulcers, they're more likely to have atypical symptoms. And what is noted here is that symptoms are worse with eating and the pain or the discomfort in the epigastric area occurs roughly 15 to 30 minutes following a meal. So the reason all of this occurs is because you can imagine when an individual eats, their stomach becomes full and gastric acids are secreted. So those gastric acids can irritate those ulcers. And that's why we can see symptoms being worse with eating. In that pain and discomfort can occur roughly 15 to 30 minutes following a meal because it takes time for gastric acids and some of that digestive processing to occur. Whereas with duodenal ulcers, they're more likely to be described as burning sensations. The epigastric pain that occurs with duodenal ulcers is more likely to occur one to three hours after a meal. So you can imagine that an individual eats, their stomach holds onto those gastric contents for a time in order for proper digestion to occur. And gastric contents like chyme are slowly released into the duodenum or the first part of the small intestine. And that takes roughly a few hours. So that's why we can see epigastric pain or discomfort occurring at roughly one to three hours after a meal. Important to note here as well is that with duodenal ulcers, oftentimes the pain or the discomfort is relieved by eating and antacids. And the reason that eating relieves symptoms is because when an individual does eat, their stomach holds on to gastric contents by closing the pyloric sphincter. And 
this prevents more gastric content from going into the duodenum. So that's why the signs and symptoms of duodenal ulcers can be relieved by eating. Duodenal ulcers are also noted to interrupt sleep. So you can imagine that if an individual has eaten and they go to bed and a few hours after they've eaten while they're asleep, they start to have symptoms. And this can be due to the fact that the gastric contents are now entering into the duodenum at that time. And this is why individuals can have interrupted sleep. And then also noted with duodenal ulcers is that there are periods of symptoms that alternate with periods of remission. So there is a waxing and waning pattern of symptoms. Symptoms are better for certain periods of time and worse for other periods of time. There are also some important complications with peptic ulcer disease, including bleeding. This can lead to melina stool, hematemesis, hematochesia can also occur, perforation of the ulcer itself. This is more likely to occur with anterior ulcers. Gastric outlet obstruction can also occur, and then pancreatitis can also occur from a peptic ulcer disease, especially with posterior ulcers. So those posterior ulcers can irritate the pancreas, leading to inflammation of the pancreas. And there's some alarm symptoms that are also important to note with peptic ulcer disease, including bleeding. So overt gastrointestinal bleeding is an alarm symptom. Weight loss is also an alarm symptom. Progressive dysphagia, so more and more difficulty swallowing and getting food down because this can lead to weight loss and perhaps may indicate some other issue. Iron deficiency anemia, this can be due to excessive bleeding and then recurrent amesis. So recurrent vomiting is also an alarm symptom as well. So how is peptic ulcer disease diagnosed? By far the most important method of diagnosing peptic ulcer disease is by EGD or esophagogastroduodenoscopy. This is the gold standard test and it's the most accurate. So you put a scope down and you can actually see the ulcers in the esophagus, in the stomach, or in the duodenum. And then you can also take a biopsy as well and look at the tissue. Barium swallow can also be used, especially when EGD is not indicated or is contraindicated. It's also important to assess for H. pylori infection. So you can do this by serology testing. So you can look for antibodies against H. pylori. You can use the urea breath test. And then you can also perform the stool antigen test. So important to note here is that serology or looking at antibodies against H. pylori, that indicates that a patient has had H. pylori at some time in their life. It doesn't mean that they necessarily have a current infection, but it means that they've had an infection at some point. Stool antigen test is more likely to be used to see if there is a current infection. So most times serologies will be performed if there are antibodies against H. pylori that are detected, a patient will be treated. And then they will undergo treatment, and then they'll have a stool antigen test to see if H. pylori has been eradicated. So that's often how it's done, but either way is used. And then histology from biopsy can also be undertaken as well, and you can actually see H. pylori in the biopsy sample. And then some other blood work is important, again, checking for iron deficiency anemia. So CBC, iron studies, and then gastrin if you're thinking about things like Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Once peptic ulcer disease has been diagnosed, how do clinicians treat it? What's important to note is that determining etiology is key because once that cause has been determined, you want to remove that cause in order to treat and prevent any further issues with peptic ulcer disease in the future. Even after the cause has been removed, clinicians will put patients on a proton pump inhibitor, medications like pentoprazole, this helps heal the ulcer. If a clinician has found that H. pylori is the cause of peptic ulcer disease, it's important to treat it. And this is done with triple therapy, so by CAP or clarithromycin amoxicillin and a PPI. And if a patient is allergic to amoxicillin, they can use metronidazole. And this is done for 7 to 14 days. And it's important to avoid the following. NSAID use. So we mentioned NSAID use before. NSAIDs like ibuprofen can lead to peptic ulcer disease. A lot of multiple shallow ulcers can occur with NSAID use. Smoking, as this seems to increase the risk and prevent or reduce the ability of the ulcer to be healed. And ethanol use is important to avoid as well because ethanol use can also lead to worsened damage to that ulcerated mucosa. So it's important to avoid ethanol use as well. So again, treatment of peptic ulcer disease. The most important key point to note is that determining the cause is important because you want to remove that cause. Proton pump inhibitors are used to help heal the ulcer. They can help reduce gastric acidity, and they can also help in cases like Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. 
And it's also important to find out if the peptic ulcer disease is caused by H. pylori because then it can be treated with triple therapy. And it's also important to avoid certain influencing factors and other risk factors, including NSAID use, smoking, and ethanol use. If you want more information on peptic ulcer disease, signs, and symptoms, please check out my lesson on that topic. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.